from How They Croaked, The Awful Ends of the Awfully Famous by Georgia Bragg. And what I love most about this book is it's kind of gross. Um, it's all about kind of nasty ways that um, people, you know, didn't, didn't make it. Um, and so I'm going to read to you today about Beethoven specifically. And it's called Between Those Ears. So it's a little gruesome, pretty perfect for October. So buckle up. Here we go. Musician and composer. Uh, Beethoven was born in Bonn, Germany. On December 17, 1770, he died in Vienna, Austria, on March 26, 1827, and he was 56 years old. Here we go. Beethoven's dad forced him to practice the piano, as dads have done since the dawn of music. We don't know what tunes Beethoven practiced, but today kids are forced to play Fuhr Elise and Moonlight Sonata, melodies that Beethoven wrote. Practice paid off for Beethoven, and he became a musical genius. He played his first gig when he was eight years old. He performed for kings, did concert tours, had a lot of fans, and even had long hair, like a rock star. And Beethoven's hair, it turned out, helped uncover how he died. Today, you can get Beethoven's music as your ringtone on your cell phone. But back then, without CDs or iPods, the only way to hear his music was live. You had to be there with him in concert. However, something went wrong for Beethoven. Eventually, Beethoven couldn't hear what he was playing at his own concerts because he went deaf. He started losing his hearing when he was 27. By 45, he was totally deaf. Over time, Beethoven had to imagine the music he was playing. He only heard what he composed inside his head between his ears under his long hair. When he wrote his Ninth Symphony, he couldn't hear a thing. That's like Leonardo da Vinci painting Mona Lisa with his eyes closed. Even though he was unable to hear, he, was, he always composed at his piano. He picked up and moved with his piano 40 times during his life, and that was no easy thing, considering there were no trucks or cranes or piano dollies. Being deaf made him not want to be with people, especially ladies. He was a bachelor and there weren't any little Beethoven, so it's kind of funny and sad that he was named the greatest romantic composer. There was no sign language back then, so Beethoven and his friends wrote notes back and forth, like texting, but with pencil and paper. Beethoven was clumsy and cranky most of the time. He had stomach problems that made him feel lousy for the last 30 years of his life, with constant diarrhea, vomiting, and gas. Houses had no plumbing yet, which means there was no toilet either. He had to use a thing called a chamber pot. In 1827, Beethoven got pneumonia and couldn't shake it. His stomach was killing him. He couldn't go to the bathroom, chamber pot. His skin was the color of a banana and blood dripped out of his mouth. Then he got dropsy. That's when fluid inside your body that's supposed to get out can't. Very quickly, Be Beethoven's body filled up with rotting fluid. He got huge. His stomach bloated and the skin stretched across it as a tight as balloon. A doctor in 1827 didn't know much more than a doctor in the Middle Ages, so Beethoven's doctors figured that all Beethoven needed was a drain that could get the liquid out. They took him to the hospital, but back then, half the people who went to the hospital came out dead. At the hospital, a hole was drilled into Beethoven's stomach, and they stuck a hose in it. Beethoven probably experienced the most painful day in his entire life, awake and without pain medicine. Beethoven watched 40 cups of grayish brown pus-like gunk flow out of his belly, enough to fill 10 quart bottles. This was right before stitches, so his doctor plugged the hole with some rags and sent Beethoven home. The gunk contained, continued to leak out of the hole in Beethoven's stomach, but his belly got even bigger than it had been before they took him to the hospital. During the next few weeks, he went back to the hospital three more times to have his stomach drained. His doctor reinserted the hose into the same hole each time, and no surprise, the hole got infected. So his doctors attempted another cure. They tried to sweat out the liquid with a steam bath. They propped Beethoven up in a tub filled with jugs of hot water. A sheet was spread on top of the tub. That They didn't cover Beethoven's head. They were smart enough not to mess with the part where all the music came from. After a few hours, the sheet was removed. Instead of sweating out the liquid, 
His body had absorbed the steam like a giant sponge. Poor Beethoven was as big as a Goodyear blimp. Since there were no such things as photographs to remember him by, a friend summoned an artist to make a drawing of Beethoven shortly before he slipped into unconsciousness. On March 26, 1827, Beethoven died. He was 56 years old. After he died, souvenir hunters took snips of his hair. Some got snips when nobody was looking, some paid for snips, and some had already snipped his hair before he was officially dead. By the end of the day, he was completely bald. Keeping locks of hair as mementos was a quirky custom, but a common one before photography. The doctors cut Beethoven's body open and performed an autopsy. All of his inside parts were too small or too big, too soft or too hard, the opposite of what they should have been. The autopsy folks sliced Beethoven's skull crosswise at the top. They wanted to look inside his famous head to see if they could detect what made him so special. They took out his temporal bones to study them, but mysteriously, the bones disappeared. And a little while later, the autopsy reports disappeared too. To remember what he looked like, wet plaster was smashed into the contours of Beethoven's face to make a thing called a death mask. It was unpleasant and hard to do because from the eyebrows up, the top of Beethoven's skull had been sawed through at the autopsy the day before. 20,000 fans came to his funeral. A ring of white roses was placed on the head to hide the mess they'd made at the autopsy. The gravedigger was offered a lot of money to remove what was left of Beethoven's head before the burial and drop it into a secret location. But the gravedigger said no. A night watchman was hired so that no one would dig up Beethoven and take his head. 36 years later in 1863, Beethoven's music was even more popular. His body was dug up and put in a better coffin. The experts took lo another look at his famous head. His skull was measured and cast in plaster. By then, photography had been invented, so they took some pictures of it too. To make sure no one stole Beethoven's skull while it was being studied, an old friend took it home and slept with it next to his bed. But mysteriously, some of the photographs of Beethoven's skull disappeared. 25 years later, in 1888, Beethoven's music was even more popular. They dug him up again and put him in an even bigger, nicer cemetery. It was then they noticed 10 skull pieces were missing. Turns out the friend who took Beethoven's skull home in 1863 to keep it safe probably ended up giving a few pieces of it away. Some way, somehow, a skull collector now had the fragments of Beethoven's skull. The family of the skull collector passed the fragments from generation to generation, and it wasn't until 1990 that the person who last inherited the bones wanted to get rid of them. Beethoven scholars couldn't wait to get their hands on them. In 1994, a lock of Beethoven's hair turned up at auction and sold for $7,300, one lock of hair. Scientists analyzed the lock and fragment and figured out something about Beethoven they could have never guessed when he was alive in the 1800s. Poor Beethoven had massive lead poisoning, 100 times the normal level. In 2010, his skull fragments were analyzed. One piece had a high level of lead, but the other didn't. They're not sure how that might have gotten lead poisoning, but it could have been caused every it could have caused every problem he had with his stomach, along with his clumsiness and irritability. But it did not cause his deafness. Stay tuned. Beethoven is more famous now than ever, and who knows what else will turn up. So if you like gross and gruesome stories like that, How They Croaked is fabulous. There's also a companion one to this one called How They Choked, which is all about famous failures. So check it out.